All right, well, my name is um, Crystal Bird Farmer, and I'm going to be talking about my book, The Token. So just a couple Zoom things. I have a puppy who can be loud sometimes, so you're just going to hear him rustling around in the background. Um, I also have a kid, but she's a little bit better when it comes to Zoom and interruptions. <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. If y'all have questions, you can just interrupt me or you can ask them in the chat. Um, you don't have to have your camera on if you don't want to. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of the, the Zoom stuff. So like I said, my name is Crystal Bird Farmer. I work as a diversity consultant and I run a school uh, for disabled children. So I'll give a little bit about my background and then I'll tell you about the book that I wrote, which is called The Token. And the subtitle is Common Sense Ideas for Increasing Diversity in Your Organization. So the idea is um, if you're an organization and you have, you know, you want X type of people, how do you do that? So that's what my book is about. And the book touches a lot on my experiences and my identity. So I'll go into a little bit about who I am. Um, so I started out as an engineer, or I, you know, I, I grew up and in, into engineering, and I realized I was pretty bad at engineering. Um, but a lot of that was also my experiences just being a black woman from a low-income family and just experiencing a completely different culture when I went into the work world. So there was it was white men. It was middle class people. Uh, it was people in the Midwest because I was from, I'm from the South. Um, and there was just so many different culture clashes that I didn't always understand whether it was me that was the problem, whether it was my culture, whether it was their culture, you know, what exactly was going on. And so that's part of what my book is about is that sometimes, you know, you as a organization or you as a group of people have to flex around how other people show up in the world. Um, but sometimes the way they show up is just the way they show up and sometimes it's not a good fit. But for me, um, I'm autistic, I'm black, I came from a low income family. I was a first generation college student. Um, of course, um, I identify as a woman and I was in a world that just wasn't really fitting, didn't understand a lot of those viewpoints or ways of being and was trying to make me fit into it. And eventually I said, that just doesn't work for me. Um, the other thing that happened was my daughter was diagnosed with autism and um, she needed a lot more support than I could give her as an engineer working, you know, eight to 10 hour days. So I stopped being an engineer and what I ended up doing was opening an agile learning center, which is a type of self-directed learning center for kids. And what self-directed learning is, is the kid decides what they wanna learn and how they wanna learn. It's also called unschooling. And it can be really, really fun for the kid because instead of a teacher or a school district telling them you have to learn this and then you move on to this grade and then you move on to this grade, they decide, well, I'm gonna learn this first and I can move on to this whenever I get interested in it. And sometimes, they don't get interested in it, you know? So there's gonna be gaps, but like with the traditional school system, there's always gaps anyway. So unschooling is a really fun way to let the child kind of develop that autonomy, to develop their voice, to kind of become who they wanna be before they get into college and have to make all these big decisions as an adult. And my center specializes on children with disabilities. So like I said, my daughter was diagnosed with autism. I'm autistic, so what we do is we um, we play all day and they learn and they grow. Um, they, that, that's kind of my day job. The other part of my work is being a diversity consultant. And mostly I work with intentional communities. So I work with um, like communes, co-housing communities, housing co-ops, um, yeah, and then nonprofit organizations. And so what I work with those go those communities and organizations, I, I help them discover how to be more inclusive. I help them work through incidents that they've had with people where someone felt like they were unwelcome or felt like they were ostracized. Um, when people have left the community, I um, 
I work through on policies and recruiting and, and all these different ways of, of identifying why your organization may or may not um, be super inclusive or diverse. And what I found, and the reason I wrote the book is that even when you have a very progressive organization, my dog is right beside me, even when you have a very progressive organization and when you have kind of a commitment to let's say social justice or just diversity and inclusion in general, you can still be unwelcoming. You can still make people feel uncomfortable and, and kind, of, kind of create an environment where people don't want to be there. And that's the kind of the number one reason why an organization isn't diverse. It's not that an organization is usually outright racist or sexist or just like really awful to people. It's really those small things. When we talk about microaggression, it's really those small things that, that cause people to just not want to be involved and just to kind of turn away. So that's what my book addresses. So the way the book is laid out, it's a very short book, by the way. It's like 118 pages. Um, so it's a quick read, but the way it's laid out is that it first talks about kind of what you need to do if you're doing a diversity initiative. Like if you're an organization and you say, I want X type of person, it says you, know, you need to develop a team. You need to kind of think about the people who may have some resistance to your ideas. So I always say you can only go as fast as the slowest person in your organization. So it's really important to get the buy-in of people. And the first way you do that is by identifying who those people are, who are the people who are going to give you a lot of trouble. You know, I call them resistors. So it's not a super negative thing, but they're going to, you know, they're going to be resistant to the ideas. And the, and the, the struggle is how do you communicate with them? How do you get to their level so that you're helping them understand this is not, you know, us imposing, you know, diversity. This is not like a making you feel bad. This is about showing up for people and respecting people regardless of where they come from and what their background is. So anyway, you have to identify those people and then you have to identify what I call the token. So um, token is kind of slang for somebody who's one of the only people. And so in my book, I use token to, um, it's slang, but it's also offensive to some people. So don't, don't use it just casually. Um, but I, um, I say, you have to think about the people who are already in your organization that may already kind of feel like they're kind of on the outside or that they're one of the only ones, you know, usually these people get pulled into diversity initiatives. They get told, hey, can you help us do X, Y, Z? Can you help us find more people like you? And I actually recommend not including those people. Um, I say, give them the choice to participate or not, but don't make them do the labor of bringing in other types of people into your organization have your main, you know, DEI team do that labor. Um, and, but, but you still want to identify them. You still want to let them know, hey, we're going to be doing this thing. It's going to cause some changes and people might be looking at you thinking like, oh, you're the, you're the cause of this, or you started this or things like that. There can be a lot of negative backlash to people. So, um, you identify your team, you identify the resistors, and then you identify the tokens. The next part of the book is talking about the kind of the three basic principles of DEI work, and that's um, identity and privilege, microaggressions, and implicit bias. And I use kind of my identities and my stories to kind of illustrate the different ways that people are marginalized or have microaggressions committed against them in community. So a common example that I use is um, Black women and their hair. You know, we are very sensitive about our hair in general. And a very common microaggression is for people to ask to touch our hair. Um, you know, for instance, I'm wearing a wig. Um, it's very common for people to be curious about Black women's hair because it can, you know, wigs are very versatile. Um, sometimes you don't know if somebody's wearing a wig or not. Um, we have a lot of historical kind of baggage, I would say, as far as like whether we can wear our hair natural, whether we can wear it braided, you know, how people respond to us, whether we look professional or not, you know, in certain settings when we have our hair in a different way. Um, 
So there's all these, these, this, this, all this stuff kind of like in our hair, around our hair. And then when somebody comes up and just like casually says, oh, I love your hair, or can I touch your hair? Like for a black woman, it can bring up a lot of things that that person didn't intend at all. You know, it's causing a little bit of harm. It's called, it's a microaggression. It's called microaggression for a reason. And it's bringing up these things that somebody is like, that was a really negative interaction. And I'm not sure I want to have that interaction again. And so that might be why a person kind of avoids that group or doesn't come back to, to that group. Um, so I talk about those identities and um, and how microaggressions happen. And then I also talk about the reaction to call-ins or call-outs. So if someone did say something like that about my hair, I have a choice to address it or not address it. And if you've heard of like the Karens or people, you know, the, the kind of reactions that people have when they get called out, that's why we kind of avoid doing, we avoid broaching the subject. So if somebody says something about my hair, most of the time, I'm just not, not even going to say anything. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, what I, what, you know, ideally what happened is that somebody else would say, hey, you know, you mentioned something about her hair. Did you know that, you know, that can be considered a microaggression? Um, and then what usually happens when somebody is accused of committing a microaggression is they're like, no, I, I didn't mean anything by it. I wasn't, I'm not a bad person. You know, how could you say that I'm, are you saying I'm being racist? Are you saying that, you know, I was trying to point out something negative about her? There's this kind of emotional kind of, I call it the stages of response. It's kind of like the cycle of grief. Um, there's these stages of response to like somebody accusing you of committing a microaggression. Um, and it takes a lot of energy to kind of work through that with somebody. So if you've ever been on the end, uh, so this is a women's conference. So if you've ever been on the end of like a, a negative comment from a man or a male identified person, you know, you have a choice whether to address it or not. And sometimes you're just like, I don't even want to deal with this. You know, that's what happens a lot of times to all kinds of marginalized people. And that's what we're trying to fix when we get into diversity work. We can't fix it by saying that everybody's always going to do the right thing because you know sometimes we don't even know what can be offensive or what can be a microaggression. So what we try and do is say, let's have a culture of apologizing, of calling each other in, of you know, of call, doing call outs if appropriate, of um, holding each other accountable you know, for helping each other learn about different marginalization. So that's how we change kind of the, the culture around us so that people feel more welcome when something happens. And then the third part of the book, it goes into specifically into kind of the steps of doing diversity work and talks about the ways that you can, um, you can set up your meetings, you can think about location, um, you can think about the kind of agreements that you have when you're doing meetings. I don't have, I didn't have, this was written in 2019. So this was before Zoom was a, a huge thing. So I don't have like a lot about how to do meetings in Zoom. But since then, I've created a presentation that talks about how to be inclusive on Zoom. But um, yeah, that's, that's the last part of the book is just all these different tips for, for, for how to be inclusive. So that's the book and I thought I would just leave the rest for kind of a dialogue if people want to ask questions if you want to go more into different sections of the book I'm open who's the book mostly been purchased by and who would you hope purchases it yeah, since it was published by New Society Publishers, it's very popular in the intentional communities movement and kind of progressive organizations. So um, like PFLAG, um, intentional community, like co-housing communities have used it kind of as a book club to go through. Um, I've uh, consulted with kind of sex positive communities like a polyamory group or BDSM groups. So I would hope that anybody who's part of an organization that 
wants to be more inclusive. A, um, a local Democratic, you know, party group has has used it. So it's written for kind of an organization that is usually like a community organization. It's not written for like big corporate organizations. It's got to kind of more in mind of people who are um, not part of like this big machine, but are just working together and just trying to do the best they can. They don't have like money to hire like, you know, a huge DEI consultant and do all this fancy stuff. They just want to do the best they can in, in being more inclusive. I have a question floating around in my brain, um, and I wonder if it's addressed in your book. Uh, I work in a few different environments, and one of the environments, um, I think the organization is doing uh, doing good work to become more diverse, so we reflect the community that we serve, and that's great. Um, and some of my colleagues who are people of color are starting to do deeper work and ask for deeper work to be done by others, where uh, like one colleague recently said, I need breaks between these meetings that we fill our days with, breaks to decompress and take in what uh, what um, the first, you know, between meetings to take in what's been discussed and to be more relational and thoughtful and internal between meetings. But we're, you know, our organization and I think many others is sort of operating by these white norms, I think white norms of like jamming everything in and going full throttle at some intense pace also set by men, right? A very white male flow of work. And so here we are operating in this nonprofit space um, with certain expectations based on those norms. And we have these amazing colleagues who are in the room saying, um, I want this to be different. It needs to be different. And I wonder if there's a, some tools or ideas that you have either in your book or on your brain that you could offer to a nonprofit like ours to shift the internal culture and flow and dynamic and pacing and all that, all that might go with that. Yeah, the first part of it is actually naming what that culture is. So in the book, I have a set of discussion questions around what I call majority culture. And that's what you named, like kind of this white male and also very extroverted, you know, fast paced culture. And what you have to do is kind of sit down and it's like, okay, how are we expecting people to behave? What are we doing with ourselves? So it's kind of at a meta level of like, how do we interact with each other? How do we work with each other? If you've heard of white supremacy culture, um, you know, um, Tima Oaken has created a website, white supremacy culture info. And, you know, there's these characteristics of white supremacy culture. And as an organization, you can just kind of go through those and say, which of these actually show up for us? Which of these don't show up for us? And, you know, it's not that everything on that list is bad. It's just that when it's taken to the extreme, it can be very exclusive. And when you have people who say, this is not working for me, if you are holding on to that, and some people don't realize how much they're holding on to that culture. If you're holding on to it too much, then you're you're excluding those people unintentionally. So just taking that overview and saying, what actually is our culture and what does it look like? That is the first step just to kind of like say, what does it look like? And then what do we feel comfortable shifting? And it takes time to shift each thing. You kind of want to focus on one thing at a time because people hate change in general. And so they're going to fight against, you know, a lot, if it, especially if it's a lot at once. But in general, you know, you kind of want to focus on one thing, like you could say, okay, breaks between meetings, you know, and I think the question in the chat is a little bit about this is like, you have to figure out who has the most power to make the changes. So if, if your executive leadership is on board, then they can say, hey, we're going to just put a 15 minute break um, in between our own meetings and kind of set that example for everybody. But if the leadership is not on board with it, then you kind of have to do what I call guerrilla diversity work, where you yourself are acknowledging what people need and you're setting those boundaries for yourself in the hopes that other people are seeing that and recognizing it, or at least asking, hey, why, why did you do that? Why is your meeting only 45 minutes long instead of an hour long? And it's like, well, you know, I want to take a break and I want to give my meeting um, attendees a chance to decompress. And that just helps the culture spread too. 
Okay, so Stephanie's Thank question is, yeah, thank you, you're welcome. Tips for diver encouraging diversity work when it's your boss or other authority who is the person you hope will hear it and change. Um, and that's a really challenging thing, but again, part of that is the guerrilla work where you are making the changes yourself and then you're in conversation. So it's really difficult to approach somebody and saying, and say, okay, we are going to do X, Y, and Z um, because it's the right thing to do. It's more inclusive. People are like, yeah, it's the right thing to do, but I don't like it. <laughs> so the way you have to approach it is um, kind of with stories and storytelling and just kind of like in, um, sharing what you've learned. So a lot of people are reading kind of what I call the Black Lives Matter bestseller list, you know, just sharing, oh, I read about this today. Um, you know, when it comes to accessibility and meetings, you can say, you know, I was reading about neurodivergent people and I was reading about how their needs in meetings are a lot different. For instance, um, some neurodivergent people don't do eye contact or they have to multitask while they're doing a meeting. So they may not look like they're paying attention, but they are paying attention. And that's just a different way of, of being in the world. Um, so you can just, you know, walk up to your boss and in your, you know, water cooler conversation say, you know, I was just learning about this thing about eye contact and that's just really interesting to me. And I think I wanna be more, you know, acknowledge when people don't seem like they're listening, maybe that's what's going on. And that helps that other person start to think, oh, okay, maybe I can think about that too. Or they might end up researching it. You know, you don't want to say, you don't want to expect that they're going to hear that one piece of conversation and suddenly change their path. But you're just introducing the idea. You're just starting to converse with them about what you've learned and being a little bit more vulnerable about, you know, how you're growing. And that helps them to be more open to hearing more. Um, and then there was something else that I was going to say. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I what I recommend. Other questions? I wonder if you can say something about uh, Zoom meetings, making Zoom meetings more. First, thank you for that. It also helps to be reaffirmed um, that, you know, I'm not doing something really horrible when I have to do two things at once. I uh, appreciate you saying that. But could you talk some about how to make the Zoom meetings more comfortable and accessible? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I do, like I said, you could, you know, I, at the beginning, I said you could have your camera off, um, you know, allowing people to have their camera off and to not be like on all the time is one way of being accessible because for some people just the idea that there's a camera looking at them is very stressful and it, it you know it distracts them from the meeting some people can't look at themselves on the screen so they have to hide you know their video so you want to encourage people to be able to take care of themselves when they're in a meeting if they need to stand up um, if they need to walk away from the computer for a minute, just be um, open to that and suggest that, especially if it's a long meeting, you want to make sure you throw in some breaks in there. Um, Zoom is very inaccessible for people who are hard of hearing um, and deaf, and then for people who have auditory processing issues. So one thing that you can do is turn on the closed captioning for Zoom meetings. And it's an automated transcription thing. So it would like if we turned on captions here. Let's see if I can do it. So captions. Yeah. So if we turn on, if you turned on captions and you click the CC button, if you can find it, um, you'll see that it's kind of talking, is is following what I'm saying, but there's a little bit of delay. And also sometimes it's wrong. So it's not going to be a perfect solution, this automated thing. And it costs money to get like a live captioner to do it. But for some people, this is actually a little bit of accessibility and helps you to actually follow along with the meeting. Um, some people, when there's a lot of talking going on, it takes them a minute to process. And then if, if, not, if like I'm talking and talking and talking and I never pause, then sometimes they just never catch up with what I'm saying. 
So taking a lot of breaks, maybe slowing down sometimes and then turning on captions. Um, what else? So slides are another thing where you want to think about accessibility. So if you have slides, you want to make sure that the text is readable. So you, you want it to be big enough, but you also want to read the text that comes up on the slides because somebody with a screen reader, you know, wouldn't necessarily be able to see or have their, their screen reader read what's on the slide because it's being presented from your side. Um, you can also type things in the chat. Like if you ask a question and have, you know, you want people to respond, you can ask the question verbally, but you can also type it in the chat. And sometimes that helps people to kind of think, you know, to see the question and, and then come up with the response. Um, silence is another thing that I really enjoy using on Zoom. It makes people really, really uncomfortable to just kind of sit in silence, but that also gives people time to process and time to think of responses or think of questions. And so that's another thing that I recommend people do. Um, and then the last one is, is never do like hybrid Zoom and people meetings because that makes it really hard for people in either group to kind of concentrate unless you have microphones, you know, kind of position that each person who's in the room most people on a Zoom call won't be able to hear what's going on in the room. And then if they're on the Zoom call and they're trying to type in the chat or get, get noticed, you know, the person who's, who's, you know, kind of facilitating both may not be able to, to keep track of everything that's going on. Yeah. Thanks, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's such great advice and I'm trying to take it in because I know it's one of the, the challenges that we're looking to, you know, we started um, here at Women, Food and Agriculture Network uh, during the pandemic, we shifted away, of course, from in-person meetings to these virtual um, conferences and we were looking to next year, like, well, maybe we need to do a hybrid and now I'm having second thoughts. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, I would just say test it out, you know, with, with a dozen people. And the bigger you get, the worse it kind of goes. Um, the best setup that I heard from a community was each individual person in the room had a microphone nearby. And then there was somebody who was just watching the chat and watching like the Zoom logistics and was able to like throw out people's questions and, and kind of help them participate. And then there was another computer that was like, controlling like the camera and how who it was looking at to make sure that the people on Zoom could kind of focus on who was talking. I know we're coming up to time. Um, I just want to thank you so much. I really appreciate, I just appreciate your your energy and the way that I think that this session is just feel very calm and not, you know, that sort of zippy Zoom feeling that I think Zoom sometimes brings. Um, so I appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone else does also. Um, and I'm, I'm so interested in hearing about your unschooling journey. And I know that's a completely different topic and that we're at time, but I just want to thank you so much for being here and sharing the highlights from your book, which I think we all need to read. Um, thanks. No, I appreciate the invitation and I, really hope that we can stay connected and I can learn more about the network you know, putting my website and my email address in there um yeah thank you for having me does anyone else have any any final questions um can you hear me Amy 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, Crystal, I was wondering um, whose work keeps you inspired? I'm, um, I was partly just thinking back to kind of what you had mentioned at the beginning about big corporations with, you know, big expensive DEI consultants. Um, and I know there, there's a whole, um, you know, continuum of, uh, of those out there now, and it's kind of proliferated. It's, own, it's like it's its own industrial complex now. But I'm just curious, whose work do you admire, do you respect, do you find inspiration from? Yeah, so there's a lot of authors that I've read that just kind of kept me going. And then there's this guy named Kazu Haga, who is doing restorative justice work. And it's just um, another kind of interest of mine is kind of accountability and restorative justice. And he has been able to kind of tap into what people need as far as restorative justice, but also to help kind of like identify the pitfalls that sometimes happen. And he comes at it from a trauma-informed space, from kind of a diversity and inclusion idea. And I, I really appreciate just kind of like bringing all those perspectives into it instead of just saying, hey, look, this is a practice that seems to work well, so let's see if we can throw it into a school or into a prison system um, that's kind of still part of the, the current thing. And then um, there's a book called I'm Still Here. Now I'm blanking on the author's name. <laughs> Austin Channing Brown. And she kind of writes about her diversity journey, but it's from a Christian perspective. And that I just, my background is in, was in Christianity. And it was just kind of like, you know, it's, is sad, but also inspiring that, you know, Black women sometimes go through the exact same things and that we come to the same conclusions. But to know that that Black women for generations have continued to fight and continue doing the work is just like really inspiring to me. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to read all these books and to, to dig, go down the rabbit hole, uh, learning more about both of those folks too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to encourage folks, um, everyone can connect on the Whova, um web app that everyone's in. You know, everyone has a profile in there as an attendee. And so folks can link up and, you know, continue this conversation also. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Crystal.